Okay, well, let's jump to the third question, which uh, I hopefully Sterling will will find uh, interesting. Is uh, Sterling, tell us all about this psychological anarchism. What's this? What's this concept? What does it mean? Uh, why? Why should people care? Right. I, I guess I'll start at the beginning. Way way before I started psychological anarchist, I was sort of juggling some ideas what to do for a Facebook page. And that Facebook page that is now called the Psychologic Anarchist was initially called the Turncoat Resource. And sort of a side story to this is I've, I have my bachelor's degree in psychology. I'm working on my master's degree in counseling right now, and I'm not too far from finishing. But as I started to continue going through taking psychology courses, learning more about psychology, being an autodidact, learning on my own about counseling and therapy, et cetera, I started to think about how I can apply this to anarchism because I hadn't noticed that anybody has really tried to apply these ideas in a systematic way to anarchistic ideas. That's when I said I was actually laying in bed one night with my wife and we were sort of tossing some ideas back and forth to each other. So this is the whole psychological anarchist pillow talk, right? <laughs> okay, so one of the things what I noticed with Turncoat Resource, it was just a more general anarchist page, and those are a dime a dozen, right? Mm. And this also goes back into the marketing thing. In order to succeed, I think you have to have a niche, right? You have to appeal to uh, not only your passions, but to certain segments of the population or people who are interested in specialized things. So I decided, you know what, I'm going to, th this is when I'm going to take this thing to the next level and my wife, she said, why don't you just change the name of your page? Can't you do that? I said, I think so, but I'm not sure. So I got on and looked at it, and I, I realized that I was still where I could change the name. So I changed it to Psychologic Anarchist. And then I started posting content around that idea. And where that has culminated over the last two years, and that was about two years ago, I guess, where that, where that has culminated into my development of this idea of relational anarchism or compassionate anarchism. And sort of like we talked about earlier, the whole goal of that or the modus operandi is to create, help try to create anarchist communities by how we relate to one another, right? That's, this is a huge deal because traditionally anarchists have mostly been concerned with, with thinking, with morality, with reasoning, and those have been the primary, the, 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 the whole focus, all of, for instance, Rothbard's books, or New Liberty, the whole focus of that is the the logical, the economic, and the moral, what I call the mm -hmm. limb axis, that's the focus of that. So I said, what if we can create anarchist communities simply by teaching people compassion and how to relate to one another? And this is just what, what I call the relational ethic or the relationalist ethic. And all that states is that compassion and love for your fellow humans is an antithetical state to that of violence, right? So if you're feeling warm and fuzzy about other people, naturally, you're not want, gonna want to attack or hurt other people. But don't get me wrong, this is not to say that the thinking and those aspects are not valuable because there's obviously a lot of cognitive dissonance that people are having to deal with because of what they've been through in their childhood, uh, what they've been taught in public schools. So all that's of vital importance. So it's sort of this merger of these ideas, relating to one another, using compassion, and the ideas of creating anarchist communities that I believe is going to create or help us create the anarchist society that we sort of dream of. And we both realize that it's not going to be a perfect utopia. It's not going to be this magical place where rainbows and unicorns are everywhere and it's, <laughs> and it's all magical, but it, it, it in theory will be a much better society than the state driven nasty dystopia that we currently live in. And all of my articles, all, not, not all of them, but most of my articles, most of my content have, have been built around this, this idea of compassionate anarchy and using the psychological trajectory to get people thinking in terms of how they feel their own internal awareness and how they relate to others, especially in terms of anarchists using nonviolent peaceful communication to help convince and persuade other people because a lot of times we have these, this hair trigger mentality, this online aggressiveness where we think that we can bash and jam anarchistic ideas into people's head with the most hostile and vitriolic language. And I don't think that that has been working out too well for us. It might work out for some people, but I've noticed that my, the people that I've got involved with anarchism has doubled or tripled 
since I started using more compassionate methods or what I call the softer approach to communicating anarchistic ideas. Mm -hmm. Gabriel, did I see that you wanted to say something? Not specifically, no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All mean, right. In, in general, that's, that's, uh, that does seem to be a much more effective approach. I mean, it's, it's fun to blow off some steam as, as we say here and just rant and, and let our, our uh, inner demons come flying out and show no mercy and have all that kind of fun. But that, that doesn't reach new people. I mean, that might get some of your current followers to cheer, but I mean, you're not going to reach new people and you're not going to attract anyone and you're just going to look like a nut bar. So <laughs> that's uh, not super useful. Yeah, I, th I think, uh, Sterling, you're kind of on the opposite end of the spectrum from people like um, Kokesh, Cantwell, and maybe even Molyneux, who are kind of um, the preach to the choir, the, hey, agree with me, or F you, you know, steal a paper clip and I'll put a bullet through your eye, you know. You're kind of on the opposite end. But here, I, I have a question for you. You say, you know, we should use nonviolent communication to convince and persuade other people of anarchism. But um, why, why should we even care in the first place to convince and persuade other people of anarchism? That right there, to me, is a very other-centric uh, point of view that's really default in the community. Like there is uh, Kokesh and, and Larkin Rose have said things like, you know, we got to convert people to anarchism, you know. You know, <laughs> here's the Holy Bible and, you know, the word of the anarchist, you know. And it's just like, why? Why? That is a self-placed obstacle. Why is the goal to change other people? Why is there a need to convert people? Why is there a need to convince anybody of anything? That, that's, no, screw that. Let's, let's set that aside. Let's just take a direct path. What do I want? What do you want? To live in a, a free society. Let's call it market anarchist society, voluntary society. Right. Well, why, you know, why do we need to convince anybody to do that? Let's just freaking do it. And uh, so and anytime somebody says, you know, we got to convince people, you know, no matter how it is, whether it's Cantwell, you know, shooting cops or whether it's Sterling saying, you know, let's use nonviolent communication. My reaction is, well, you know, both of you are, are throwing up an artificial roadblock to your own uh, freedom. Sure. Yeah, my response to that is different people have different motivations in the anarchist community. There's, there's quite a few people, George, that take your position. And, but there's also people who take sort of both positions. Maybe sometime in their life they want to go out and actually convince people or persuade people that anarchism is, is correct. And, I, and from my experience, most people, if they, if they don't want to do it, if they don't want to go out and try to talk to people, spread the gospel of say that kind of ironically, spread the gospel of anarchism, they at least want to convince their family members, the people close to them, to see if they have any commonalities and that there's anything they can share in. And, I, and I've always found that pretty important because I, I like being around people who share my values and I'm around my biological family members, you know, quite often. I don't live very close to them anymore. And what this has resulted in is I have convinced my brother of anarchism. So now he actively wants to participate in the community. He wants to participate in various forms of subversion. And I call that a win in my book. But if you're somebody, you know, like you, George, who just wants to go out and just, just do it, just start living it, you know, by, by all means, let's definitely, let's definitely do that. So I, I'm of, you know, the, the school of thought that multiple paths to creating and erecting anarchist societies is definitely the case. But I've always been interested in, in rhetoric and communication and trying to persuade people in the best possible ways while relating to them. And I, I think that that ability to try to shift somebody's internal paradigm toward anarchism and to shift their train of thought and the way that they feel about themselves is also going to be vital to shifting our 
society in the direction that it needs to go. And I'm not, yeah, you're right. I'm not too different in terms of the way I'll use Larkin Rose as an example. His, his thought process is that we should teach people or to argue with people and, and to suggest that this idea of authority is a superstition, right? That it's, it's nonsense. And that the more people that we can convince of, of this idea, the better off we're going to be because what he created that little red dot video, it, it basically the state would be useless and rendered obsolete as more people start to change their thought processes and ignore them. I, you know, I tend to resonate with that quite a bit, except I just think that it's more of a, the communicational approaches that we use are going to also help push us in that direction. But if you want to go out and, and just live and just do, do that, or maybe do both at the same time, I do a little bit of both. And I actually think using steam it is an inherently anarchistic act. It will probably become more so as we continue to move into the future. So, but is, it, is your goal though, is your goal though to change other people or is your goal to achieve liberty for yourself? Yeah. So if, which one is it? My goal is just to relate to other people in a, in the most anarchistic way possible. So it sort of kills, it's another, you know, two birds with one stone kind of thing. Yeah. Right? But do you see like you're putting other people in, I mean, Either, either you do want liberty for yourself and you've put this artificial roadblock in your own path of achieving it, or you don't actually care about achieving uh, freedom for yourself. Do you, do you see? No, that, so the question for me, for, right. for the people who are concerned about converting people is, why, why, why do you care about converting people so much if your ultimate goal is to achieve freedom for yourself. And, you know, so, I mean. In, in, my, in my mindset, that's, that's dichotomous thinking or that's a false dichotomy, right? Because I think that what I'm doing accomplishes both at the same time, right? Yeah, so, but if I, want, if I want milk, do you see, if I need a, a gallon of milk, do I try to convince somebody else to get it for me? Or do I just go straight to the supermarket and buy it myself? So right. that's why I think folks like everybody who's saying we got to convert people. I, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a blunt guy. I don't mean to be mean or insulting or anything, but I feel like you guys are driving everybody in the wrong direction. Uh, I, I would use my numbers sort of to combat that. Because I think the approach that I've taken actually has created more anarchists. And so I, that's what I'll, I'll say to that, but yeah, yeah, but if you, you could have a million anarchists, but if they're not living as anarchists, you know, understand if they're just talking about it, if they're not doing anything about it, what's the yeah. purpose? Yeah. It's I, like I, knowing how to read, but never reading a book. Right. No, I, I appreciate your position. You know, that's, that's great. But I think that once people understand what anarchism actually is, first of all, talking about it is doing something right. That is an action. When I speak to people about anarchism, when I try to relate to people, that is doing something. And then not only that, but I have the, the other effect of them starting to live anarchically. So I think that that's a, definitely a positive thing in, in terms of the direction that we're going. But I, I don't have anything against you for wanting to take the, the direction that you want to take, wanting to just live instead of using your time or spending your time trying to just, just live it rather than to convince other people. And of course, there is the irony that, that sort of just talking about these ideas online where other people are going to hear them with you. And that is a form of persuasion, although it's happening indirectly. Right. right. Um, I think that if you, live, uh, if you live it, people will naturally be guided. You'll, you'll influence people. They'll be like, oh, he's living a better life than I am. I wonder why. And they'll start emulating your behavior and copying you. That's a form of influence by living it. Um, then there's a lot of people who are so, you know, concerned. They're not going to see it from other people. They're not, they're, they're just going to write it off. But uh, Sterling's, Sterling does offer a funnel for people that won't read Atlas Shrugged or other uh, similar types of uh, information, but they will stumble across it on Facebook because somebody shared it because they saw it, you know, and shared on a group that they're in, they're into. And so, you know, that's, that's one additional way. The, these, it's just an additional access to the concepts that I think 
a lot of people may need help um, being exposed to. And then, and then once they're exposed to the words and they, if they do any little consideration, it'll trigger a chain of events in their mind and they'll come to their own conclusion and they'll start emulating the uh, behavior of being peaceful um, in that way. So I think it's, I mean, I agree with you, George, actually, that it's best to be self-interested. If I'm self-interested in this show, and so because I'm self-interested in this show, I try to bring to the table of the show as much as I can, and I'm trying to always think about new ways to do that. Same thing with Steam It, um, because that's just the way that's that's the way that works. But a lot of people don't want to hold themselves accountable as being self-interested, so they 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 write it off as though they owe somebody else something. Uh, that collectivist mentality. <laughs> I see that huge head nod, Gabriel. <laughs> yeah, but, but the thing, Stephen, is implicit in the things you're saying is a value judgment that I, I, just, I just wonder, it's taken for granted in the libertarian community that you have to bring other people around to the libertarian point of view. That is an assumption in almost everything that happens in the libertarian community. We have to bring more people. We have to bring more people. And that's, I, I, that needs to be questioned because if the goal is to have a nice conversation, um, then, you know, that's your, I think, uh, you know, Sterling, Lark and Rose and the others, they're achieving that goal. They're having great conversations. Where does it lead? Where does it lead? Everything, you know, if the goal is to live in a, a free society, then I don't think you can say, well, it's going to spark an idea and then naturally things are going to happen. No, because people have been talking about anarchism for hundreds of years. But people haven't been well, reading anarchism for hundreds of years. Sure they have. Sure uh, they have. Uh, some people have. Some people yes, have. And, yes, some people and have. those people have very well emulated some anarchism into their life. There's a whole load of people that have not. And those are the people that need a different form of exposure. Those are the people who are sucked into the system that we so very much hate due to its authoritarian in nature um, but in your own you, why do you keep talking about other people why are they important to your own quest for liberty and in fact my ultimate point is so like I, so the, my minor point here Stephen is you are implicitly uh, not you, you're you have that assumption that the other people matter and you're not questioning it it's no I don't I, and my larger point is that the whole quest to convert the world to libertarianism is a complete waste of time because Ab not everyone will come around. Precisely. And that you, you can't expect that just exposing people to something is naturally going to make the whole thing happen. That if we make it happen somewhere, that that is going to be an irrefutable proof that it, there are benefits in this. You know, just like the first electric car, the first Tesla electric car was irrefutable proof that electric cars work. Why, cars why do you identify with it? Why do you identify with this value system? Which one? Um, anarchism or, uh, yes, or libertarianism. Why do you identify with it? I'm, I'm going to ask you a series of questions that is going to make you realize that um, – it's it's something that people observe when when they observe it they see the results of it like i said earlier and they recognize oh shit i can make my life better by applying this um and you did the same thing i've done the same thing everybody who's in this conversation and probably listening who's going to be listening did the same thing at a certain point um it's a natural next step to observing a benefit um, and the benefit that they want to live. It's not about converting people. You just live well enough and people are just going to be like, hey, what's going on with you? Why are you doing so well? They'll get interested themselves. It's, that's their self-interest coming to you. It's self-interested for you to 
in that way, get them into your life so they can provide value to you by you giving value to them of the philosophy. It's just another form of that transmission of ideas. It's not important, but you want to keep it at a peaceful level. So, um, you know, there's the riling people up isn't necessarily the way, but living it and then talking to people calmly about it, that gets people interested. If you ask them the right questions about why they do something and they'll say, I don't know. And then you say, well, this is why I do this. And they'll be like, hmm, you know, I should give that more thought. Or, I, I, or they'll just, boom, I just converted them. Um, you know, I hope that's not the case. But, you know, people, people do see a more obvious solution once it's pointed out to them. They're locked into a reality tunnel of, um, you know, the same one we escaped from at a certain point. So, yeah, but that's, that's what I'm saying actually is that we have to live it, not just talk about it. And by live it, I don't mean in an attempt to, to convert other people to be a shining example. I mean, live the damn thing right? and actually live it completely and go find somewhere to have an anarchist community where we actually live a stateless society, you know? So, and have that as the goal. And there's no reason to insert other people in between us and that goal. But here, I, let's, let's let Gabriel have a word. Yeah. As somebody who actually well, took Obviously, him. that is, I mean, I guess it was Harry Brown's book, How I Found Freedom in an Unfree World, that really pushed me down that particular path of putting myself first and achieving my own freedom first. Converting other people is just kind of a nice side effect that happens in your life as you you know, smack into other people and have conversations that are productive and all that kind of stuff. But I tend to agree that like making the conversion of other people a priority is kind of a waste of time and kind of misguided. But I mean, for those that are out there doing it, whatever, if that's what gets them off, fine. I would kind of suggest that they're often not honest about their motives. I'm not saying all of them, but generally a lot of them that I've come into contact to, they make it out as if it's some kind of a moral duty, like converting other people is good and it's something that they have to do in order to be a shining example or however you want to put it, rather than just admitting that it what makes them feel it it's what makes them feel good. It's what gratifies them. It's what gives them a sense of purpose and all that kind of stuff. So I don't know. It's like, I'm, I'm taking the action approach and just naturally finding people kind of snowball and attach on and whatever. And of course, as you know, we are actually building a physical community to live at for people of that mindset, thing like, things like that here. And we just kind of have to, keep at that, see how it goes. And more of them are going to be sprouting up. I'm seeing more of them popping up right now. Um, we've got like Liberland, we've got the Free State Project, we've got, you know, seasteading attempts and things like that. And you just kind of have to give those time. Sterling, you want to get in the last word on this topic and then we'll jump to our last question. Sure. And I, I just want to, I guess, to add to this whole debate, it's important to realize that we are uh, social animals or community driven creatures and we are essentially built on attachment bonds with other humans this is a very well-known fact of psychology and human neurology and that's one of the reasons why I think it's really important that we not and, and it's not just about at least for my philosophy not just about persuading with people it's about interacting with people it's about how to relate to people in the most peaceful ways possible and how to identify with their where they're at in life and this doesn't mean you necessarily have to do this with every single person that you come along with my my this aspect is not necessarily prescriptive it's also descriptive if you're interested in taking that that route but it all it is good to keep in mind that we are relational animals and that we crave social attention and living in societies so I don't think personally anything is wrong with trying to provide those values to other people by both by living them, like uh, you attest to George, and by also talking to people about these ideas, because it is, uh, it's also good for the individual because it's intrinsically psychologically healthy. So I think that's super 
important and that will that will help push us where we need to go but yeah absolutely if you want to live it live it if you want to talk about it talk about it if you want to do both do both uh, to me it's and I, I don't I really try not to get wrangled into these you know these logical arguments because it's not really the focus of the psychological perspective but you're right it is good to discuss these ideas and it is good to bat around uh, the different opinions on how precisely to approach it. So I appreciate that very much. All right. So uh, let's jump into our final segment. And, uh, you know, Sterling, uh, you know, who is Sterling Luhan? You know, where, where are you originally from? Uh, tell us about how you grew up and, you know, your interests and things. 